Well, good morning, and uh, let me welcome everyone to the campus of George Washington University. Um, today is uh, quite a poignant uh, day. Uh, it's a day when we can remember, reflect uh, upon those horrific attacks uh, on 9-11, but also a day when we can remember the heroic acts of so many men and women of all stripes in all sorts of uniforms, from our first responders to our first preventers, to our men and women in, uh, in our armed services uh, uh, taking the fight overseas. Um, it is also, a, uh, uh, and especially for me, um, uh, important session because this will be my last session hosting uh, an event as the director here at our cyber uh, uh, center at George Washington University. Um, I can't tell you how many luminaries we've hosted on the stage, um, including all of Secretary Nielsen's uh, predecessors. Um, and uh, I couldn't think of a better person to host than Secretary Kirsten Nielsen today. Uh, Kirsten comes to, to the Department of Homeland Security with uh, uh, an amazing background on homeland security issues. She's an original plank holder uh, at TSA of the department, like so many in this room. We all tried to enlist ourselves in uh, our country's greatest time of need, uh, and Kirsten was there from the very get-go. Uh, she served in various roles in the White House, um, overseeing resilience, overseeing uh, information sharing, critical infrastructure, uh, and dare I say, she was a senior fellow uh, here at our Center for Cyber and Homeland Security for a number of years. So I've had the privilege, the pleasure, uh, and the great opportunity to, to, to work with Secretary Nielsen uh, for a number of years. Um, and to all of you, I mean, I love GW. We've had so many luminaries on this stage, and, uh, and I'm just so happy that uh, my final session will be with uh, a luminary and a friend and a colleague, Kirsten Nielsen. So please join me in welcoming Secretary Nielsen. So I have to say, now we're starting off bittersweet uh, with, the, with Frank's announcement. So why don't we just all start by giving him a round of applause, please. <laughs> so thank you, as always, uh, for the kind introduction. And thank you to George Washington for hosting us here today. And I'd also want to take a moment, it's always a little bit hard for me to see with the lights, but I want to take a moment to thank everyone and anyone in the audience who's either at DHS or who's been at DHS. Uh, if you've been part of the community or the homeland, why don't you stand up and let's give you a round of applause. Thank you for everything you've done. So this is a beautiful facility. Uh, at some point, hopefully sooner than later, we look forward to welcoming you to our new headquarters at St. Elizabeth. We never know quite when that is. It was supposed to be maybe last year, maybe this year, maybe next year. But at some point, uh, we look forward to welcoming you. We've certainly come a very long way. For those of us here, and I'm looking around, those in the audience who were early days at TSA, uh, I think our new building will do us justice uh, compared to our very humble beginnings where you would walk down the halls of that old GSA building and when you knew you saw the you know, cockroaches upside down, they could not even survive in that building. So you knew it was a little bit questionable, guys walking around with face masks to uh, work on the asbestos. And then, of course, my favorite, my office uh, originally at TSA, it was kind of down the hall. Uh, if you remember when we started, we started in a big room with a bunch of laptops. We eventually broke into other rooms as we expanded. But somebody might not have known I was yet in the office, so they came in one day with earphones, and I'm sitting there typing away, and he just started changing to go on a jog uh, before, he, before he saw me. So in our new headquarters, we will have both rooms uh, for such activity, uh, but hopefully we will not have asbestos or cockroaches, so we have come very far. Today, though, what I want to do is describe five major challenges in our threat landscape, and I'm really going to focus on man-made threats. Uh, much has been said, much should be said about all of the natural disasters that we will continue to face, and 2017 was certainly a historic year. Uh, but today I'm going to focus on the man-made threats. I'd like to explain how we're building resilience into everything we do, preparing our frontline defenders to protect America in a new age, and responding to all of these evolving threats. 
Next week, uh, as Frank mentioned, will mark a very important anniversary. It's been 17 years uh, since the 9-11 attacks. And it's truly a, a yearly anniversary where we have the opportunity to take stock, be very thankful uh, for where we've come, but also to look at where we need to go and how the landscape is changing. We're many years from that pivotal moment uh, that gave us a permanent mission at DHS, but we will not let time nor space dull our memories or weaken our resolve. Nor can we afford to, especially with new storm clouds forming on the horizon, and that's what I'll talk about today. In the months prior to 9-11, then, then CIA Director George Tenet said that the system was blinking red. We heard enough chatter to know that something was coming, danger was coming, but we didn't quite yet have the pieces and weren't able to connect the dots to know when it would occur or exactly what form it would take. My colleague Dan Coates, the Director of National Intelligence, recently also said that the system is bleaking red once again. His concern in those comments was about our nation's digital infrastructure, and he's right, and we'll talk a bit about that today. Our digital lives are in danger, like never before, but it's more than that. We're witnessing historic changes across the entire threat landscape globally. We can see the winds blowing, we can hear that thunder coming closer, and we must prepare. The balance of power that has characterized the international system for decades has been corroding. America's unipolar moment is clearly at risk. Power, vacuum, power vacuums are springing up across the globe and are quickly filled by hostile states, terrorists, and transnational criminals. They all share one common goal, however, which is they want to disrupt our way of life. They're inciting chaos, instability, and violence. And at the same time, the pace of innovation, our hyperconnectivity, and our digital dependence have opened cracks in our defenses, creating new opportunities and new vectors through which the nefarious actors can strike us. It's truly, when you think about it all together, so you've got new threat actors, you've got a whole changing environment, you've got this pace of innovation. It's truly a volatile combination. The result is a world where threats are more numerous, more widely distributed, highly networked, increasingly adaptive, and incredibly difficult to root out. Our policy at DHS in the face of these growing dangers will not be strategic patience. Instead, we are reasserting US leadership. And we are building the toughest homeland security enterprise America has ever seen. Our approach begins and ends with one word, resilience. We will never forget that in our darkest hour in 9-11, we saw real heroism, we saw renewed hope, and we saw relentless resilience. It was a time when our incredulity was replaced by defiance, and our rallying cry was marked by unified determination. United We Stand was written on sidewalk chalk, on bumper stickers, and in the hearts of Americans everywhere who pledged not to be intimidated by evil. Born from that commitment and that relentless resilience was the Department of Homeland Security. This year, we marked our 15th anniversary and we have come a long way. But years later, we are still not prepared for everything we can't be. What we can do is instill a culture of resilience into our everyday lives. That culture is not just about bouncing back, but about bouncing forward. When innovating while we're under attack and coming back stronger to stare down the next challenge more decisively than before. I'm pleased to announce that this month we will release a new DHS strategic plan, a resilience agenda that will guide our actions in defense of the American people. Our resilience agenda is about leaning in against today's threats while zooming out to prepare for those on the horizon, about being adaptive to keep pace with our adversaries, identifying and confronting systemic risk, preparing at the citizen level, building redundancy and resiliency into literally everything we do, and raising the baseline of security across the board and indeed across the world. Perhaps more important than anything, though, are the partnerships that we build and maintain at the Department of Homeland Security. In today's world, dangerous actors are crowdsourcing their chaos, their threats, and terror, and we must crowdsource our response. But that's only possible through deep, public, private, and international cooperation. Partnerships used to be a nice to have, but now they are the lifeline of America's survival. So what has changed since 9-11? The world is very different uh, than it was in 9-11. And post 9-11, we saw that threat continue to morph until it is what it is today. 
In congressional testimony, Frank in 2006 referred to bad weather, bad bugs, and bad guys. At DHS, we still confront all three. But the bugs have expanded into the digital realm, and the bad guys are not only terrorists, but nation states and transnational criminal organizations. Today, I'll talk about five major shifts in our threat landscape and how we are bringing our resilience agenda to bear against them. So first, and let's set the stage with this, we must recognize that the home game and the away game are no longer distinct. They are, in fact, one and the same. After 9-11, our strategy was to take the fight to the enemies over there so that we didn't have to fight them over here. Unfortunately, that's no longer the world in which we live. Our enemies don't respect our borders, and they aren't constrained by geography. Today's threats exist in a truly borderless world, so that's how we need to operate. Today, DHS actions abroad are just as important as our security actions here at home. We have thousands of personnel forward deployed throughout the world who are taking an end-to-end -end approach to dismantling these threat networks. This phenomenon, the merging of the home and away game, magnifies all the others that I will talk about today. So secondly, terrorism and transnational, transnational crime have spread across the globe at fiber optic speeds. After 9-11, we faced a centrally directed terror threat, but today that threat is everywhere. The US government has terrorism investigations today in all 50 of our states. Self-made operatives are popping up across the globe. DHS stops 10 known or suspected terrorists a day from traveling to the United States, and those are just the ones that we know about. And even when we destroy jihadist sanctuaries abroad and we have decimated the so-called caliphate, they are able to hide in virtual safe havens online. Groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda now direct, finance, and inspire attacks all from their smartphones. This allows them to act anywhere, anytime in a networked community. They're quite literally turning Twitter followers into terrorist foot soldiers. And in so doing, they are promoting do-it-yourself terror by urging followers to adopt a bring-your-own-weapon policy and to conduct violent acts wherever and whenever is convenient. I can assure you, though, that DHS is not sitting by on the sidelines while this occurs. In fact, under this administration, we have made the most sweeping counterterrorism enhancements at the department since its creation after those tragic events on 9-11. We have put in place historic measures to keep terrorists from infiltrating the United States, to stop them from radicalizing and recruiting in our communities, and to prevent them from carrying out their sought-after attacks. For instance, last year we announced the first ever global information sharing baseline, a requirement that every nation in the world share information with us about terrorists and take action to make it harder for them to travel undetected. The handful of countries who failed to comply now face travel restrictions or other sanctions, and I can say with confidence that this baseline has made America safer. This month, I will make additional recommendations to the President on ways we can press foreign governments to step up their sharing and efforts to prevent terrorist travel. We have also implemented the toughest screening and vetting measures we have ever had to help us weed out violent extremists. And we are conducting deeper background checks on foreign travelers, screening applicants against more intelligence information, using biometrics to confirm identities, and conduct conducting more thorough departure and arrival screenings. And before the year ends, we will open a groundbreaking national vetting center to bring it all together. I very much look forward to telling you more about that as that comes online. Despite their success with do-it-yourself terror, groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda are still focused on executing major attacks, especially against the aviation sector. In just this past year, we've seen some of the most disturbing aviation plotting we have ever tracked. But we've met that threat by putting in place the most significant upgrades to aviation security in a decade. In response to threat intelligence, we have required every airport in the world with flights to the United States to implement new seen and unseen measures to detect concealed explosives, guard against chemical weapons, identify insider threats, and identify suspicious behaviors. International flights are now more secure than they have ever been. But there is not nearly enough time to fill you in on all of the other counterterrorism steps that we have taken. But I do want to mention that they include engagement with the tech sector to make it much more difficult for terrorists to weaponize the web and 
with their propaganda, new efforts to protect soft targets nationwide against attack, an overhaul of all of our terrorism prevention programs, and a focus on helping our community spot signs of terror sooner and more. Very soon, the White House will be releasing a bold new counterterrorism strategy that will put our enemies on further notice and lay out a path to victory against them. And criminals, the last point on this one, criminals are exploiting that same environment as the terrorists in order to build cartel superpowers with sprawling networks. Indeed, a decade ago, transnational criminal organizations, or TCOs, were much like the terrorists of the 9-11 era. They were confined to certain geographic areas with centralized command and control and a much more limited focus. But today, they are spreading rapidly, outsourcing their work, diversifying their activities, and cooperating with ever wider cabals of identity forgers, smugglers, traffickers, drug runners, fixers, and killers, and the list goes on. They are not only embedding their enterprises further into the physical world, they are also selling their illicit wares in the virtual world. So today I'm pleased to let you know that DHS, along with our interagency partners, is launching a new effort to crush TCOs. In the coming months, we will stand up a pilot fusion cell that will bring multiple agencies together under one roof to map out a truly global and comprehensive approach to defeating these threats and dismantling these networks for good. TCO should be worried. The president continues to set his sights on their downfall and we are stepping up to take action, regardless of where or how they hide or operate. So third, and this is a big one, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here. Third, we are witnessing the re-rise of the hostile nation state. DHS has spent many years since 9-11 focused rightfully on non-state threats. But our nation state rivals are increasingly asserting themselves in ways that endanger our homeland. In fact, threats to the U.S. from foreign adversaries are at the highest levels since the Cold War. Countries such as China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia are willing to use all elements of their national power, financial trade, cyber, espionage, information operations, and more, to undermine us and to advance their own interests. Even in peacetime, adversary nation states are now taking the fight directly to citizens attacking their devices, compromising essential functions as we saw in the Ukraine, attacking them as we saw in the recent UK poisonings, or seeking to destabilize the heart of the democracy that we depend on through malicious influence campaigns. And they're encouraging us to turn against each other so that we tear each other apart from the inside out. We really have never quite seen anything like this, particularly in peacetime. It's not a fair fight, and neither private companies nor citizens are equipped to wage a battle against such a Goliath. So we must partner together. Top of mind for most Americans is the egregious Russian interference in our 2016 elections. At Vladimir Putin's uh, direction, Moscow launched a brazen, multifaceted influence campaign to undermine public faith in our democratic process and to distort our presidential election. Although no actual ballots were altered by this campaign, make no mistake, this was a direct attack on our democracy. We should not, cannot, and will not tolerate this or let it happen again. Election security wasn't a mission we envisioned in the department when it was created, but it's now one of my highest and continuous priorities. And in the past two years, we have worked hand in hand with state and local officials to make our election infrastructure more secure than ever. We are sharing intelligence nationwide with election officials. We are forward deploying cyber experts to help states scan and secure their systems. And by the midterm elections this year, more than 90% of registered voters will live in an area where our network security sensors are deployed on their election infrastructure. This is unprecedented in terms of forward movement, but we won't stop here. On election day, our folks will be out in full force and hosting a virtual nationwide situation room to monitor activity. So to move the ball forward even more, today I'm calling on every state in the union to ensure that by the 2020 election, they have redundant, auditable election systems. The best way to do that is with a physical paper trail and effective audits so that Americans everywhere can be assured that no matter what, their vote is counted and it is counted correctly. 
DHS is also undertaking new efforts in partnership with the FBI, Intel community, and others to counter foreign influence through close industry engagement and foreign partnerships. In fact, last week, I secured a commitment from our Five Eyes partners, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, to collaborate more closely to block meddling in all of our democracies. More broadly, I have directed a shift from a counterterrorism posture at DHS to a much broader and wider counter threats posture to make sure that we're doing everything possible to guard against nation state interference. We're overhauling our crisis response teams and our advisory boards. We're reorganizing our intelligence units into new mission centers, very similar to what the CIA has done to help guard against these foreign threats. And we are taking steps to prevent adversaries from infiltrating United States companies and critical industries. Fourth, and very related to this re-rise of the nation state, is that cyber attacks now exceed the risk of physical attacks. So let me say that again, cyber attacks in terms of their breadth and scope and possible consequences now exceed the risk of physical attacks. Don't get me wrong, terrorist criminals and foreign adversaries continue to threaten the physical security of our people and they are likely to do so for the foreseeable future. But cyberspace is now the most active battlefield and the attack service extends into every single American home. Some estimate that by 2021, a cyber crime, da cyber crime damage is estimated to hit six trillion annually. To put that in perspective, that's almost 10% of the world economy. But it's not just cybercrime we're worried about, although we do combat that too at DHS. In a matter of keystrokes, an adversary can wipe out bank accounts, knock out critical service, take down vital networks, and lock down or alter data, calling into question its very availability and integrity. Such attacks can spread well beyond their intended targets and have unforeseeable cascading consequences. This is the viral spread of volatile malware. Indeed, we have moved past the epidemic stage and are now at a pandemic stage, a worldwide outbreak of cyber attacks and cyber vulnerabilities. We saw it last year when both Russia and North Korea unleashed destructive codes that spread across the world, causing untold billions in damage. The reasons countries launch this attack, though, is simple. They can, and they think they can get away with it. Too often, they have. Now more than 30 nation states have cyber attack capabilities and sophisticated digital toolkits are spreading like wildfire. DHS was founded 15 years ago to prevent another 9-11, but I believe an attack of that magnitude is much more likely to reach us online than on an airplane. As we speak, the bad guys are in our networks checking for open windows or doors, and everyone and everything is a target individuals, industries, infrastructure, institutions, and our international interest. In response, earlier this year, we released a new cyber strategy that outlines how we are changing the way we do business. Above all, it highlights how we will identify and confront systemic risk, moving away from a focus on the protection of specific assets or systems. You see, the more interconnected we are, the more your risk becomes my risk my risk becomes your risk. Anyone or anything to which you are connected can be that weakest link that makes you and me susceptible to attack. In July, we hosted the first ever National Cybersecurity Summit where we brought together top CEOs and cyber minds to discuss these very issues. We agreed that we can't afford to defend ourselves in silos. If we prepare individually in this environment, we will fail collectively. We must move away from endemic vulnerabilities to system-wide endemic resilience. To support this strategy, I also announced the launch of the DHS National Risk Management Center, which will serve as a central hub for government and private sector partners to share information and together better secure the digital ecosystem. We will identify single points of failure, concentrated dependencies, and those cross-cutting underlying functions that make us vulnerable. We are also driving forward ambitious supply chain security efforts to identify upstream weaknesses before they have downstream consequences. And we are working with our partners throughout the administration to hold cyber attackers accountable. We will no longer naively assume that a nation state with cyber capabilities chooses not to use them. We will no longer tolerate the theft of our data. 
We will no longer stand idly by as our networks are penetrated, exploited, or held hostage. Instead, we will respond, and we will respond decisively. The United States has a full spectrum of options, some seen, others unseen, and we are already using them to call out our cyber adversaries, to punish them, and to deter future digital hostility. Our adversaries have been warned. The days of cyber surrender are over, and this administration is replacing complacency with consequences, replacing nation's deniability with accountability. But there is a roadblock preventing us from getting where we need to be. DHS wasn't built for a digital pandemic. Our cybersecurity arm, the National Protection and Programs Directorate, needs to be authorized in law and transformed into a full-fledged operational agency. Today, I ask Congress again to pass legislation immediately and absolutely before the year ends. Fifth and finally, emerging threats are outpacing our defenses. Simply put, they're faster, they're better, they're innovating more quickly. This is what keeps me up at night. Drones are a prime example of this. 10 years ago, a drone was something the military used overseas. A few years ago, it was the hot toy on wish lists. But today, it's a major national security concern in our homeland. Terrorists are using drones on the battlefield to surveil and to destroy. Drug smugglers are using them to monitor Border Patrol officers so they can slip into America undetected. And criminals are using them to spy on sensitive facilities. Drones can also be used to disrupt communications or to steal data via nearby Wi-Fi. Imagine a drone dropping a small bomb on a busy street or in a football stadium or releasing chemicals into a crowd at an outdoor concert. It's not sci-fi anymore. This, thrill, this threat is real, and it is here today. I will continue to sound this alarm because we desperately need Congress to act. Outdated laws prevent us from setting up the sophisticated defenses we need to protect big events, federal facilities, and other potential targets from an airborne menace. DHS does not have the clear legal authority to identify, track, or take down dangerous drones. We can't even test our defensive measures in civilian environments. So once again, I also call here on Congress to get moving and to pass bipartisan legislation that's supported by the Senate and House Homeland Security Committees. We need these authorities now before it's too late. I also want to quickly mention weapons of mass destruction. We are seeing terrorists and nation states more willing than ever to use chemical and biological weapons to conduct attacks. Just in the past year, Russia poisoned civilians in the UK using a deadly nerve agent. The brutal Syrian regime used chlorine and sarin gas to attack their own people. ISIS deployed chemical weapons on the battlefield, and authorities disrupted a terror plot to use toxic gases on an international passenger flight. DHS is taking these threats very seriously. Last December, I formed the DHS Office of Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, or CWMD. It was the largest reorganization in years and has already helped us better protect the American people. But although we have broad authorities to guard against radiological and nuclear dangers, we do not have everything we need to do the same against chemical and biological threats. However, thanks to the leadership of the House Homeland Security Committee, there is a bill to strengthen the CWMD office by empowering it with the authorities it needs. I'm hoping we can get this done soon. There is a theme here, and that it's we really need Congress to act, to give DHS the authorities to keep up with these emerging threats as we spot them and before they fully manifest in our homeland. So today I wanna to close with a bit more about resilience. I'm a great admirer of Teddy Roosevelt's speech, Man in the Arena. My folks know it. I've cited it many times this summer and in the spring in meetings and town halls throughout the country, and I suspect many of you know it as well. But Roosevelt's timeless words bear repeating nonetheless. And as he said, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, 
who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. We live in turbulent times. Some days it feels as if there are more critics than doers, those who repost their rage online and troll their fellow citizens. But the present discord in our discourse does not and will not define us. The 240,000 men and women of the Department of Homeland Security have found an antidote to this acrimony and it's called mission. Every day, they roll up their sleeves and go to work to build a better and safer America. They enforce the laws passed by Congress. They believe in accountability, and they do not let unfair criticism defeat them. They are in the arena. They are relentlessly resilient. And I urge you not only to learn from them, but to support them. Whether is it a FEMA employee responding to fires and floods, or an ICE agent taking a murderer off the streets, or a Coast Guard lieutenant seizing drugs off our shores, or a CBP officer stopping a terrorist trying to enter the country, or a TSA agent working to keep explosives off of airplanes, or a USCIS officer helping a family of refugees find a safer life in our country, or a Secret Service agent taking down a fraud scream, scheme, or a cyber analyst sharing threat indicators to stop a digital heist, or the many, many, many other employees who work to protect our homeland. They all deserve our respect and gratitude, as do their families, for when one serves as DHS, their family serves too. I can tell you firsthand these patriots have thwarted real plots, real threats, and real danger just the nine months I've been on the job. They have your backs, so we should have theirs. Although I am often asked what keeps me up at night, I am rarely asked what gets me up in the morning. I will tell you that what gets me up in the morning is not only the solemn honor and duty to protect the homeland, but it's to support the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security. I'm proud of their resilience, perseverance, and service to our great nation. DHS is a department of heroes. And as long as I am secretary, I will do everything I can to support them so that, with honor and integrity, they can continue to safeguard the American people, our homeland, and our values. And in closing, the thank goes to each of you who day to day work so hard and are so dedicated to protect our country. Thank you for everything you do. Secretary, thank you for a tour de force. If you can join me here for a QA. and a And um, I mean, taking stock of where we are, but also being very sober in terms of where we need to be as a country, I think it's, it's, uh, it's only apropos given, uh, obviously, uh, the 9-11 anniversary coming up. I, I'd like to start with um, where you started aviation uh, security. Um, there's been some good news, and I'm not going to ask you to confirm whether it's true or not, but uh, the demise, hopefully, of Ibrahim al uh bomb maker out of uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, big concern for a lot of people for a number of years. Um, but I think, most importantly, his innovation, unfortunately, has been shared with others. How would you suggest or where do you think we are in terms of aviation security? What are the greatest concerns out there? And, and what should we be thinking about? And what could the rest of us be doing to try to make, uh, make that easier, better for, for the men and women uh, responsible for that awesome responsibility? So uh, the challenge with the aviation threat is it just continues to evolve, right? They're looking to make explosives smaller. Uh, they're looking to develop additional weapons. Uh, and they travel. So it used to be we really focused on where terrorists were in terms of a physical area, but now they're spread out throughout the world and they post sort of the, if you will, the instructions uh, on how to make a weapon. It's almost an Ikea-like instruction book. Hmm. So we work very carefully with industry to pull down that content. 
Uh, the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism has been uh, very helpful in doing so. But we also have been working really hard to improve our technology. So I'm happy to say we're putting online our uh, CT machines, our computed tomography. And what that will allow us to do is give us 3D images of passenger luggage as they go through. Uh, and will allow us to turn it around, see what's behind it, and really have a much better automated way to understand the threat through algorithms. So it's a combination of technology, working with industry, pulling down the content online, and partnerships. We have to make sure that every airport raises that global uh, level of security, or they will just travel to an airport that doesn't and then try to come to the United States. And the front end information sharing has improved exponentially, and uh, the, t uh, the uh, screening vetting center, I think, would be a, a great step in that direction as well. Um, let me just touch now briefly on sort of the jihadist threat as we see it today, or the terrorism threat as we see it today. Um, obviously, it continues to morph and change, based in part on our successes. Um, I, I'd be curious uh, in terms of, A, where you see the, uh, the, the Al-Qaeda threat in particular, and B, what are we doing, what is the department doing to work uh, with our state and local first preventers, law enforcement, first responders, to try to, to get as far left of boom as possible? So this is an area, you know, if I step back and look at it, I would say, uh, you know, everything we do at DHS, as you know, we do through a system of systems approach. We do through layers of security. Uh, this area is no different. So we look at the full life cycle, if you will, uh, of how this works, and then we try to attack it in bite sizes. So all the way, beginning with a terrorist attempting to inspire others, direct others, finance others through the internet. I already just mentioned that, so we work on that piece. Uh, then we work on screening and vetting to make sure that terrorists cannot travel to the United States. I mentioned that we are stopping 10 uh, known or suspected terrorists today. Those are the ones we know about. Big so we numbers. continue to uh, share terrorist watch lists uh, with other countries. We talked about that also uh, with our five eyes. To the extent that terrorists then are inspired or are present in the United States, we work to de-radicalize them, uh, to counter message, to provide an off-ramp, if you will, working with state and locals to help them not only spot suspicious behavior, but to really have awareness campaigns within the community. Uh, in some cases, those who are drawn to the violence uh, are looking for a particular type of outlet to communicate, to express themselves. So part of the challenge here is what are the ways in which we can provide safe ways for them to do that, to communicate through speech uh, as opposed to violent acts. And then on the back end, as you know, we're very worried about foreign fighters uh, and returning and figuring out where they're going, tracking them, we're worried about recidivism. How do we work with state and local communities when those get out of jail? So you kind of, those are only a few of the steps, but you look at it from the full cycle uh, and then through our changes to our terrorism prevention programs, we look at combating all forms uh, of violent extremism. And how about uh, interaction with social media companies? Because uh, uh, the underpinning ideology is obviously an issue, whether it's for uh, all stripes of terrorism or, or any uh, single is uh, issue group that, that may have a, a violent ideology. But how are we, how, how is the department and how have your interactions been with some of the primary um, social media companies? And what lessons on the counterterrorism side can be gleaned vis-a-vis -vis cyber or the cyber active measures piece, the, the influence campaigns we're dealing with as well? So, you know, easy I think, question. <laughs> yeah, easy question. I, you know, I think back about 10 years ago when we were working with private sector and it was truly uh, focused around critical infrastructure, owners and operators, uh, morphed a bit into cyber in general in terms of we're all interconnected and how do we do that. But now, as you just described, we're working very closely uh, with tech companies in particular, but private sector companies on uh, taking down terrorist use of the internet, uh, taking down child uh, exploitation websites, uh, disabling live abuse, uh, which unfortunately continues to proliferate around the world, and working with the private sector, in particular with the FBI, to really identify this foreign influence, foreign interference problem. 
It's much more nefarious and insidious because at the heart of our democracy is freedom of speech. So we're not trying to stop freedom of speech, but we do have a belief in this country that we want to know or at least have a sense of knowing who is saying what uh, and if we are being manipulated. But that's a much more difficult challenge. I'm happy to say the private sector is stepping up. Uh, they are working to identify, uh, as you know, bots and trolls and others who are masquerading uh, as people that you might know online. Uh, but it requires a very close coordination. We're working on hashtag databases, uh, trying to identify IP addresses where we have continued to see nefarious activity emanating. Uh, but it's, it's a challenge. It absolutely is a challenge. And it's not getting any easier. No. <laughs> uh, uh, so for, for transparency, you've always been my go-to on cyber, long before you were uh, uh, um, the, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. So let's transition on some of our uh, cyber uh, sets of issues. Uh, firstly, um, I, I think that uh, your strong comments on there will be consequences. Um, I've been a broken record on this for a long time, that we need a cyber deterrent strategy. Um, I'm getting the sense that there's some momentum to, to at least recognition uh, as well as some momentum to actually devise a deterrent strategy. Can, can you give us some hints as to what that potentially could look like? What you think the department's role is? Because I think resilience is also part of a deterrent to bounce Absolutely, back yeah. and minimize the impact or consequences of, of bad behavior. So can you sort of shed some light on where you think uh, that's heading? Um, I also had the, the privilege to, 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 to sit in and, and, and also sit on a panel at your first summit uh, in New York and having you and General Nakasone have a real discussion about the offense-defense, which is, as you said, is all blurring. Uh, the away and home games are getting uh, more and more difficult to discern. But that was a powerful uh, uh, day because you could see the various tools and instruments of government that could be brought to bear. So any insights on that? Am I, uh, am I right to be hesitantly optimistic that we'll have a deterrent strategy coming? I, you should be optimistic. Good. Uh, as you know, I could talk about this all day. So uh, let me <laughs> And you know these issues inside <laughs> now. Let's so. see if I could uh, focus on these. First of all, I think we have to prioritize. Uh, and that's really where uh, we've tried to shift our focus at DHS. We can protect every asset in the system, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but we need to both recognize that the vulnerabilities can be introduced anywhere in the hyper-connected world. Uh, and we also have to understand that the most difficult things to reconstitute are going to be those essential functions. So it's really prioritizing on single points of failure, concentrated dependencies, those cross-cutting functions, it's and how we together right, uh, prepare. And part of that's partnership. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about uh, that at that summit, and that's actually why we have stood up the National Risk Management Center, to really work arm in arm with the private sector to contextualize the threat of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We have the NCAC, as you know, that works on the day-to-day, moment-to-moment threats, 24-7 technical collaboration. But we needed something to look forward to really think about uh, what's changing in terms of the, the cyber attack methods. I also think it's very important at this point to think of cyber more broadly. Cyber itself, cyberspace itself, uh, can be a target uh, when we talk about critical infrastructure SCADA systems. It can be a weapon uh, when we talk about destructive malware. And it can also be a new vector through which old criminal nefarious activity is conducted, i.e. cybercrime. Right? Mm -hmm. Criminals haven't changed. Now mm -hmm. they can just do it online. Technology changes human nature yeah. pretty consistent. So technology has this, is this wonderful capability to be a force multiplier. And I want to be very clear that technology is not the problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as it evolves and its uses evolve, we have to make sure that we have continued resilience built in to address it. I, I think you raised a very important point. The technology is not the problem because that right. does get lost. Even with deterrence, it's not about cyber. It's about bad actors engaging in cyber activity. So ultimately, you need tailored approaches to different bad actors. Russia is not China. China is not North Korea. North Korea is not Iran and on and on the list goes. So I think that's a uh, very, very, uh, uh, you, that's a point that should be underscored. And you know, I would just add there too, it not only is China different than Iran, different than North Korea, different than Russia, it also depends on what perspective you have. 
I was just mm -hmm. with my, you know, Five Eye partners to Australia and New Zealand. Little They're active extraordinarily worried yep. about China. Yep. Absolutely. Everything we say about Russia, they say about China. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the uh, list of countries that are, are becoming hostile, if you will, uh, resurgent, uh, are different. It's mm -hmm. just different ones are acting in different ways uh, regionally throughout the world. And those that are integrating it into their war fighting strategy and mm -hmm. doctrine are at the very top of the list in space and some of the other uh, sets of issues. I also want to touch on CISA. Uh, we have some of the drafters of the legislation in the uh, audience today, and I uh, want to thank the House Homeland Security Committee and Brendan and others who've been uh, uh, advancing this for a number of years. Um, can you let us know, it's more than a name change, it seems to be. That seems to be what everyone sort of jumps, that's the bumper sticker uh, response. But why is this important to the department? Why is it important to the department's mission to get things done and what, in what is now known as NPPD, which I've known every undersecretary, but I still don't remember what it stands for, so it's a side. I'm kidding. We all but, stumble, uh, no. But, uh, but, but tell me why you think that, uh, that it is uh, important uh, and also what we can do to help get that over the goal line. So I want to always add my thanks. Uh, Brendan and others know they how, deserve how it. They've been active. No, no, they, they have. Um, uh, we we have to get it done. I, I, this is one of those ones where uh, it shouldn't be controversial. Uh, everyone agrees that DHS is on point for the civilian uh, .gov domains. Uh, we're on point for helping critical infrastructure. Uh, and now we're on point for helping state and locals uh, protect their elections. We have the mission space. We are not able to organize to meet that operational space. We need to be an operational component. Mm -hmm. The name change, though, is on one hand sounds trait. On the other hand, is so very important because having cybersecurity and infrastructure in the name is not only an indication to our stakeholders of where to go, but it puts us on par with other agencies that have other parts of the cyber puzzle. So it gives us parity in the interagency, it helps us work with international partners, uh, but it really helps the private sector understand where to go and how they can interact with us. And I'm so happy you brought up the private sector, the customers and clients you serve. When I go back to 9-11, uh, it was largely our first responder and preventer community? How do you connect federal, state, local? And then obviously our critical infrastructure owners and operators. I mean, it was Verizon that was just as important to get Manhattan up and running, uh, Wall Street up and running uh, after 9-11. So I, I, I think that uh, when we think about cyber, the department's role in terms of serving as the advocate, the enabler, the connector with the critical infrastructure community and with the, the private sector is essential. So I think it's not just about government. It's not the boxes and org charts and the alphabet soup here in DC. It's all those you serve. And, and I think that that's uh, important. I want to touch on another point, and, and, and you raised this in many different ways in your uh, speech today, um, physical cyber, but also the convergence mm -hmm. of the two. How do we address, I, I mean, I think any form of conflict, physical or otherwise, is going to have a cyber dimension to it whether it's targeting, whether it's intelligence collection, whether it's communications, whether it's the enabled trade craft, or whether it's a weapon as a platform, uh, and, and vice versa. How do we deal with this hybrid kind of threat that literally cuts across everything that we do as a, as a country? And, and you were very strong on UAS and yeah. counter UAS. I mean, it's sort of the new IED. Right. Um, and uh, uh, I'd be curious what your thoughts are in terms of the physical cyber convergence issues and where the department can marry up both its physical security and its cybersecurity uh, mission, as well as counter UAV. What's coming down the pipeline? It sounds like we have a ton of authorities that are not aligning with the threat. Right. So that's issue one, get those authorities in place. But then I'd also be curious, what are the... Um, uh, what's cool down the pipe, what's coming down the pipeline that we could get excited about so maybe Congress will act on this. A uh, lot there, Don. Yeah, a lot there. So let's start. I've never had an unspoken thought. <laughs> let's start with the, uh, let's start with the drones. I, you know, I, uh, I, I've talked about this a lot uh, over the last few months and it, it's always an interesting experience because when I do, most often whomever I'm talking with 
cannot believe what I'm saying is true in the sense that they can't believe we don't have the authorities we need uh, to identify, monitor, track, and interdict, mitigate this threat in the homeland. And we just don't. Mm -hmm. um, even if you look just at that monitor piece, just at the tracking piece, under current outdated laws, we would need a warrant. The drones fly 140 miles per hour. I would have to figure out how to get a warrant hmm. after I identified it, hmm. just to be able to track it, and that still doesn't give and me that's authority not even to mitigate it. Disabling or take down. That's right. That's yeah. just watching it fly really, really fast. Wow. So we really lack authority here. Uh, there are authorities, uh, limited authorities, the Department of Defense has to protect DoD facilities here. Uh, we have some very limited authority within the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. We, of course, have authorities uh, in theater, uh, but we simply do not have authorities cool. here. So it, it is something uh, that, w that Congress just has to do. It's bipartisan. Uh, it's time. It's a clear threat. It's here now. I hope they. I hope they choose to take it up this fall. Wow. The convergence issue is much more difficult because it used to be, uh, again, say ten years ago, uh, we would be sitting here and we would probably be talking about data theft and the amazing amounts of data uh, still that are being stolen. <laughs> right, and we still are. But now, you know, not only are we worried about that integrity and availability that I mentioned in the speech, but now we're worried that cyber itself can cause a physical effect. Exactly. So it's not just that SCADA systems are both physical and cyber, but together a physical uh, attack can cause a cyber, a digital disruption, mm -hmm. and a digital attack can cause a physical disruption. Mm -hmm. We also have seen hybrid attacks, as you know, such as, um, you know, at Metcalf, where we had some attackers uh, with guns blow up a transformer, mm -hmm. but then they cut the fiber optic lines, we think, to try to uh, disable communications for 911. Mm -hmm. So you see them doing it at the same time. I absolutely think it's true that our adversaries are using cyber to prep the battlefield, which is the last point. And that's so there. Just, I'm going to ask you the unfair question. Okay. And uh, I'll bite my don't, don't, don't. Uh, if what the Ukrainians saw play out two years ago, where it was a cyber enabled attack, occurred CONUS, would that trigger? Uh, we're still all struggling with what is an act of war. Yes. But if yeah. you can get attribution of a hostile act by a nation state, what would that response look like? Yeah. What's the commensurate response and would there be any, would it, would it be the lawyers defining that or will it be the people who actually know, uh, uh, of course lawyers know everything. <laughs> and, and we have a lawyer uh, here, but, but who, who ultimately is gonna call that shot? So what, what would that look like in the sit room? Too? Yeah, no, I mean, so what we're working on right now, uh, two things. First of all, we got to attribute faster, mm -hmm. right? We just have to bring everything we have to bear, particularly with our allies, so that we can name names as soon as possible, not many months later. So that's step one. In terms of consequences though, that have to go hand in hand with that attribution, right now we're working on developing tool sets, and it really is everything. It's uh, diplomatic relations, it's trade, uh, it's broader economic policy, uh, it's certainly any authority I have within the United States. Uh, and bringing it all to bear, some of that will be seen, some of that will be unseen, uh, to make sure that that adversary knows there's consequences. In terms of whether it's commensurate, uh, I'll speak for myself here, uh, you know, I think it needs to be more than commensurate. Here, here. Uh, by the time that a country is attacking civilian networks, here, here. civilian assets, again, it's not a fair fight. Uh, that's not how the international uh, world has created norms and standards. Uh, and I don't think it should be commensurate. I think it should be more. Hoorah. I, ho I hope others uh, are listening to that because it's absolutely right. I, I mean, you can't just blame the victim. Right. <laughs> and, and, and it's like getting your home robbed a million times and you just call the locksmith. Uh, it's time that there are some, some, some uh, significant consequences, and I hope that that is uh, the case. We got time for two more really quick questions, because yeah. uh, I could go on all day, and, and, uh, uh, and, and as you can tell, the Secretary Nielsen is a wonk, as well as uh, overseeing such a, a, an amazing uh, organization. That's a compliment. If you didn't. That is a huge compliment. Uh, in my book, that's the highest compliment. So uh, a, a couple of other quick thoughts. You mentioned briefly WMD and, yes. and some of the threats there. What, what can we expect in the biodefense strategy? What should we be thinking about there? And, and biodefense seems to be one of these issues, and I see Jim uh, uh, in the audience today, seems to be one of these issues that goes from hair on fire 
to law, to hair on fire, to law, basically predicated on what we're seeing in the threat uh, domain. But what are your thoughts here? What 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 should we be expecting there? Yeah, I, I agree. It has been uh, it has been cyclical since 9/11. I think what's different now, again, uh, the proliferation of the recipes online, uh, the fact that terrorists now have access to chem and bio. It's not just nation states, uh, and an increased willingness and demonstrated use of such weapons against civilians. So now we're we're back up at a very heightened alert. Uh, within Homeland, we do have the authorities we need for radiological uh, and nuclear detection, uh, but we need much more on bio and chem, and that's something Jim and the CWD office are really working on. So I think the bio strategy will uh, take all the goodness that so many and, and folks in this room as well have worked on to really make the case of what is the best way to detect uh, and to do it in an automated way that immediately translates into, into action. Uh, we just don't have time to wait anymore. So uh, even on the toxic gases uh, that I mentioned at, at one point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we've been working with state and locals uh, on pilots for handheld detectors. Part of this is just starting to raise awareness. This is a different type of threat, different type of threat for crowded spaces, soft targets. How do we instill uh, a new level of resilience and understanding uh, and expectation setting, unfortunately, with respect to the threats to come? Uh, but it needs an upgrade. We're at the next level of maturity. The adversaries certainly are. We've got to meet it. And last question. I, I mean, last year we witnessed so many devastating natural disasters. Yes. Um, I, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. What lessons have we gleaned? And in particular, how do we work with the private sector and the critical infrastructure? Because here you're looking at a new physical cyber convergence issue, looking at it through, I mean, I guess the bad bugs, bad weather, bad people, whether the cyber or biological variety are still with us. But Absolutely. What, 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 what lessons can we glean from uh, uh, such a, a, a devastating number of natural disasters last year? And what does that mean from a resilience perspective? Because I think the title of your remarks and your remarks itself, the, the relentless resilience, that is something we can do. We can't always get in the minds of the bad guy and shape the way they act. We have to sometimes be responsive there, but we can always be resilient, psychologically, physically, uh, kinetically, uh, and the like. What, what, what lessons can we glean from all of that? So, you know, I just uh, got back from Hawaii last week. Uh, it's a great example of some uh, relentless resilience. I guess you didn't uh, get to enjoy the weather. No, yeah, uh, no, yeah. but, you know, they started with these uh, monumental floods in April, uh, went through volcanoes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, went through uh, hurricanes, went through forest fires in the middle of the hurricanes on uh, one of the islands. Uh, then ended up with more flooding and mudslides, and this wow. was all in the span of a few months in, in one state, one, wow. one uh, group of islands. Wow. So you do have to keep operating. I mean, the point is you have to find ways to have redundancy, to think about reconstitution, to really adapt and innovate while under attack, whether it's from a natural disaster or it's, it's a man-made attack. And certainly in cyber, it's a very different concept. You know, I've talked about this before, but it's not if, Mm -hmm. And it's not even when, mm -hmm. it's how long can mm -hmm. you withstand attack? Mm -hmm. How can you gracefully fail? Mm -hmm. What is your plan B, C, D to ensure that those essential functions can be performed? All of that can only be done in that whole culture where everybody plays a role. Madam Secretary, the tyranny of time requires I be a bit of a tyrant, but I want to close with the Teddy Roosevelt quote, because he is my favorite president uh, of all time. And... Uh, I'll never forget, he said, I, I have never envied a human being who lived an easy life. You have the hardest job, uh, one of the hardest jobs, but you oversee some of the um, most committed women and yes. men to our country, to our national security, and to our homeland security. Um, and your life may not be easy, but gosh darn, it's important. Thank you for your service. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for uh, being a senior fellow. And, and uh, I will always be bleed buff and blue GW, but I am now a war eagle, or soon will be. So uh, go Auburn. So All right, thank you, Madam Secretary. And I'm still in DC, so thank you. <laughs>